Out of all the emulators out there, PCSX2, the PlayStation 2 emulator, is by far my favorite. And I've closely monitored its build development for more than 14 years now. I just wanted to say massive congratulations to the developers and everyone who was involved in any capacity. This emulator is more than 21 years old now. Emulating PlayStation 2 hardware is like building the Empire State Building with plastic straws. A huge challenge which developers have continued to overcome. Over the life cycle of this emulator, most changes that I've seen were regarding graphics. There were a ton of graphics plugins, but the two finalized graphics plugins were GSDX and Zero. GS. For majority of the games, DSDX gave best performance using DirectX and Zero GS gave best performance using OpenGL. Eventually, only GSDX survived and developed in the later releases. Up until now, GSDX was able to render using DirectX 9, 10, 11, 12 and OpenGL. But recently, developers have finally added the support for Vulkan. I do believe that over 95% of the games will run just fine regardless of the renderer you use on low-end to mid-end PCs, but the love for the emulator is appreciated. All the PS2 titles are now bootable on PCSX2. Seriously, every single game. So far, I've only seen PCSX2 and RPCS3 achieving this milestone. Vulcan was in development for a very long time and we've seen slowed progress of the emulator, mostly because it is very stable and extremely optimized. But there were a number of titles which desperately needed the performance of Vulcan. While other renderers could run them just fine using enhancements or other optimization options within GSDX, the plugin definitely took a toll on performance even on some capable machines. Vulcan is certainly giving a performance boost to these games. Even with how stable it is, I would still categorize it as experimental option and use it on a per game basis. Since the inception of PCSX2, the devs decided to go with 32-bit implementation of the emulator. I've had X64 machine for a long time, like a lot of people trying to run the emulator and trying to take full advantage of the architecture. But some crucial constraints made it difficult to have that implementation. I personally think that they wanted to make a functional and optimized emulator first with a healthy catalog of games in the playable category before they got to X64. Because X64 isn't going to change anything but the performance gains are very noticeable. Whatever the reasoning might be, I think we can all agree it's better late than never. UI has changed a lot from the earlier days, but after almost two decades, devs have decided to revamp the whole UI. They have decided to go with QT, which not gives it an updated look, but it's also relatively easier to program, versatile, and the updates can be pushed out regularly. Most of the settings have been renamed to more user-friendly names and more accurately represent the options features. We also have an option to scan all the PCSX2 games. Are there games where Vulkan isn't going to help that much in performance? Absolutely. For that, we need a bit of context. Rumor is in the late 90s, game developers making titles for PS2 needed to learn the hardware. In some circumstances, the development schedule was so crunched that they couldn't really go in-depth regarding the hardware. As a result, they couldn't fully utilize the GS or graphics synthesizer, the graphics chip on PS2. They had to rely a lot on CPU, which was Toshiba Emotion Engine. These early PS2 CPU-dependent games really suffer in performance on PCSX2 and are very hard to emulate. I'll give you an example. This is Taken 5 running on this hardware. Pretty playable. This is Taken 4 running on this hardware. Also playable. This is Dragon Ball Budokai 3 mod running on this hardware. Again, very playable. And this is Taken Tag, a game rumored to be CPU dependent running on the same hardware. It is very difficult to tell without actually debugging and reverse engineering these games whether the claim is true or not. But I think there might be some truth to this claim, at least to some extent. The next section of this video is going to focus on the settings for PCSX2. So if you only came here for an update video, this is where it ends. But continue watching as some ideal settings for demanding titles are going to be discussed. I made a guide a couple of years back about PCSX2 where I explained every feature in excruciating detail. I think it still holds up very well. A lot of features that I explained are now integrated into the emulator and no longer available to tinker with. Less options and less hassle of course. So I wanted to go over a couple of settings to explain them and give you tips on getting best performance. If you want to go even more in depth, you can refer to my older guide with detailed timestamps. Please go to the GitHub page of the PCSX2 page and download the latest build from here. 
Secondly, we need to dump BIOS from our PS2 and the link to that is in the description. You can also download BIOS for PCSX2 online but it's technically illegal and I wouldn't recommend it. After all this we can launch the emulator. Unlike last time, I'm going to skip over the obvious options and talk about configurations that matter. One thing we're going to do is enable the show advanced settings from here. All other options in the UI are pretty self-explanatory. So we're gonna move in straight into settings. In interface and game list, we have pretty straightforward settings. And moving on to the BIOS, we can select the firmware or basic input output system file for PS2 here. This should be the downloaded file or the firmware dump. Make sure the fast boot is enabled as it's gonna let us skip the boot up animation every time. In emulation settings, we're gonna keep this to default. Within the unskippable cutscenes, you can press tab to fast forward in certain areas. Within system settings, we have EE cycle rate. Now, this is the Toshiba Emotion engine, the CPU within the PlayStation 2. If you remember earlier in the video, we talked about CPU dependent games, the early era of PS2. If you come across those games and your hardware is decent but you still can't get decent speeds, make sure it is 130% overclock. Also don't go overboard as this is the only viable option in my opinion. Going more than 130% can crash your games and make the whole experience inconsistent. So a couple of seconds you're getting 60 FPS while at other moments you're getting below 10 FPS. We're gonna keep this disabled. Affinity controls are some priorities control. These can be used as experimental options. Majority of the titles that I've tested didn't get a performance gain from these options. VU1 can be thought of as a core of the processor and these two options are enabled by default. Multi-core processors aside from dual core processors can take advantage of these. Please keep them enabled. Scale to refresh rate will try to match the refresh rate of your machine to various degrees of success. Okay, so there are four potential renders that we can use and only a very few titles can get performance gains by switching the renders. For majority of the machines, Direct 3D12, Vulkan and OpenGL are available. For low-end machines and graphic cards such as NVIDIA 600 or 700 series, only the Direct 3D11 and OpenGL are going to be available. And your machine is going to crash if you select Direct 3D12 or Vulkan. For mid-range to high-end machines, you will use Vulkan for best performance possible and then fall back to Direct 3D12 for wider compatibility. For the most accurate experience, however, use OpenGL, but be aware that it is very demanding in terms of specifications. Other options are categorized as experimental, and while they can fix some artifacts, they don't necessarily increase performance in majority of the cases. So there we have it. What an amazing journey this emulator has completed and still on its way to achieve more things. What I've learned from the past couple of years of updates, the emulator has new UI, has x64 support, has Vulkan support, and newer emulation quality of life changes. Not to mention the centralization of most table options and the simplification of the whole ensemble. I will keep an eye out for any significant changes to PCSX2 and I will let you guys know. Till then, this is Rogue Hat. I hope you guys enjoyed this perspective. Thank you so much for watching. Catch you guys later.